Hi everyone, I'm Tess Niehoff again, the E100 project manager, um, and I'm here to bring you guys today another episode of our podcast, International Development 101. So we're here today with Dr. Cornelius from GB Ghana, also Morgan. Morgan, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everyone. My name is Morgan Siraki. I'm a program associate working with Global Brigades. So my role is to work with volunteers and in-country teams to coordinate brigades and prepare volunteers for brigade. And I'm here with Dr. C, Dr. Cornelius. Dr. Cornelius, can you introduce yourself to the students that might not have met you before? Yeah, sure. So uh, my name is Dr. Cornelius. Uh, I'm a medical doctor. Uh, I work with Global Brigades Ghana as the medical director. I've been with uh, GB uh, since 2016, working to implement our health uh, solutions. It's great to meet you all. Great. All right, Morgan, let's go ahead and dive in. What do we have for Dr. Cornelius today? Dr. C, can you tell us about historical events in Ghana that may have affected the development of the country up to today? Yeah, sure. I mean, there are so many um, instances or situations that have affected the um, development of Ghana, uh, and we could take them in broad I mean, perspectives. Uh, we could talk about the political aspect, we could talk about the economic aspect. And then I'll delve uh, a bit more into how NGOs or international organizations have been able to also, I mean, come in to, to assist in how development has, has gone, I mean, in, in, in our country, of Ghana. So basically, I would uh, talk, talk a bit about the economic aspect. I mean, way before uh, Ghana was quite a hub for trade, uh, basically because we were called the Gold Coast. That's just before we had independence. So... What we used to call the, tra the transatlantic trade was basically a lot of getting gold out of West Africa into Europe or across the Americas. And then uh, later on, the unfortunate thing happened of where human beings were also trans I mean, moved through the same route you know, in return for some uh, goods for the country. As that ended, we could see that a lot of trading started happening again. And then that was just before the 19th century. So economic activity started booming again because now people knew what they could get from the West in terms of they could easily get, I mean, guns, they could easily get some merchandise to be able to leave all over here. And then they could also send the raw materials out. So it, it, the trade actually continued. So Ghana has basically been a, quite a hub for trade. And that is still very common. We are very good in some crops and we are one of the world leaders in, in, in producing those crops, like cocoa. We are second to Cote d'Ivoire in the world in terms of production of cocoa, and gold is, 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 is a big thing here. Probably we can be just far behind South Africa in terms of the amount of gold that is produced in, 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 uh, over here. Recently, just about 10 years or a little, a little above that ago, we also discovered oil. That's more to the western point of, of, of the country. So there's a lot of economic activity and a lot of products that are being, you know, uh, traded in our environment. So definitely that should translate to a lot of foreign exchange or a lot of, you know, wealth for the country. But there's a lot of issues in that regard in terms of how that wealth is distributed and who actually gets access to this kind of trade benefits that happen. Yeah, that, that's what brings me to the political aspect of development. And uh, the political aspect has been a bit checkered. The reason being that we've had, we've not had a smooth transition of power since uh, we had independence in 1957 from the British. Uh, our first president who was elected is called Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. He was somebody who was very enlightened and somebody who was so visionary. So he started a lot of projects that we actually enjoy now. I can give an example like the, the Tema Motorway, which is one of the, the first motorways that we had in terms of a highway. And it's still, even since the 1960s, it's still being used now as a major conduit between Accra and Tema, which is more like the trade region of, of Ghana, the trade part of Ghana. And we have also the Akusumbo Dam, that is the electric generation part of the country. That was built in the 1960s, and we are still making use of that. So the first point of leadership, of political leadership in Ghana, was, was one that, of, that had vision, you know, one that had a lot of development, industrialization. But as, as we know, I mean, a lot of things happened. Six years into, his, into the Republic, we had the first uh, military overthrow of the first coup d'etat. We took him out. We had to get a new person to take over. And always, it's always difficult when a new party takes over or a new leader takes over. It's always hard to, 
to continue what the other person was doing because you might probably have different ideas. I mean, some people might also give Kwame Nkrumah some stick in terms of he had some bad aspect, but I thought he was visionary in terms of the kind of industrialization and the kind of projects that he started and the kind of community development ideas that was actually started from the beginning. I think it was a good vision. So we, we had this coup d'etat that came in and then 72, we had another one, but in 72, the, 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 the one who took over was a bit more people centered. So he wanted to actually what we call the operation feed yourself and all that's that slogans where people were supposed to actually make their own garden, plant your own food, feed yourself. And also as you have larger lands, you can actually plant more to feed your neighbor or feed the whole country. So the whole idea was to be able to use a lot of the lands that are quite arable lands that are left and can be used to grow crops for Ghana. That didn't stay much. Uh, he was in power for a while, but was also overthrown. So we had a good part of uh, political, in terms of democratic uh, leadership in about 1979. And that's when Dr. Hilal Iman came in. But he also didn't leave for long. He just stayed for about, about a year and a half to two years. And then he was, he was overthrown again by another military leader who actually ruled till 1992, where we actually came into the Fourth Republic, where we called, we had a the constitution came in in 1992, and then we now had to start with the whole politics where we could vote and vote people into power. That started in 92, and the same person who took you know, power as a major leader was voted into power in 92 and voted into power in 96. So that means that he stayed on for about 20 years. Yeah, but we saw a lot of massive development within that period because... I mean, it was a country that was just getting out of colonization and then coming into a whole new, a vibrant environment. So we had a lot of things going up where we could have buildings, roads, schools, churches, and all that springing up within that period. And as we entered the democratic dispensation, where the constitution was functional and all that, we could see that a lot of respect for human rights, a lot of respect for other things were, came, into, came into being. And Ghana was then looking like a beacon of hope to uh, the West African countries and the other countries. And uh, so with all this political instability, so since the 92 constitution, we've had peaceful handover of, you know, power to other, either parties. We actually have two major party, parties in Ghana, the NDC and the NPP, and these two parties have held on to power over the last, since the 1992 elections. And they've, there's been a peaceful I mean, Handover, we've not had any war or civil wars that has come out of any elections that has happened. And just recently, we actually had a sitting president handing over to, to, to an opponent, and which was a peaceful one, which is usually not something that happens in our part of the world because of the love of power and the love of good things that come with, with, with being in government. So with all this checkered history of political coup d'etats and also democratic dispensations, we've definitely had some impediments in our development. But notwithstanding, there's been a lot of massive work. There's been a lot of massive improvement also. Since uh, Ghana is, is, is seen as a beacon of hope in the West African country politically and also in terms of infrastructure, because every party that comes to power tries to actually add something to what has been done. If not add on to it, they're able to do something for themselves. Uh, a lot of this is I'm going to elucidate them as we go along the chain. And the other part I'll talk about is also the social aspect. There's been a lot of social development in the country since the beginning. I mean, educational-wise, there's been a lot of educational, I mean, materials. There's been a lot of stuff that have been, you know, uh, in terms of the school system, because from the beginning, we were supposed to have a free, you know, compulsory basic education for everybody. So everybody at a point in time is supposed to go to school, at least have the basic education up to the junior high school level. And that is free. That is compulsory. Everybody is supposed to do that. So there's been quite a drastic move also in the social aspect because people were getting educated much more. People were also getting a lot of socialization in terms of a lot of volunteer spirit, in terms of having that spirit to be able to, to work for your community, to be able to put something in your community. So we had, I mean, we had a lot of programs that were there to actually create that feeling of having communal spirit and getting the social capital really well in our communities. That was something that was started quite early. And uh, I would just say that for now, we, uh, we've lost a lot of that. But at some point in time, that was very, very common where communities were empowered. Communities were actually ready to participate in anything that would benefit them. And they were able to make these choices on their own and not wait on external 
you know, efforts to be able to, 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 to participate quite well. So um, there's been quite good development, but definitely too, there's been a lot of back and forth due to the political, you know, arena. Uh, one major thing we wouldn't leave out is also corruption. Corrup- corruption is quite um, a nebulous term, but uh, defining it is difficult, but it's something that I think has caused a lot of development, you know, hampered development in our country, Ghana. Basically because, I mean, I think people are probably just naturally greedy. They want to have the good stuff to themselves and then be able to, 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 get, to get a better life, to be able to uh, increase the livelihood of their families, not thinking about the other people, not thinking about other people in the community. So we've had a lot of that going on, especially in the aspect of politics, because of politics, usually after the constitutional review or the constitutional introduction, it became a one-man takes all. So if your party wins power, you have everything for yourself. There's, the other party doesn't have a say. You, you decide who is going to be here, who's going to be there, who gets a contract. So a lot of things were going on where a number of people were making a lot of money for themselves and for their families, where they could even buy houses in New York, buy houses in Madrid, and buy houses in the UK, just to have some form of wealth. And that also resulted in having a, a huge wealth gap where we have a few people being so rich and a lot more people just below the poverty line where they could not even get just one dollar a day to feed. So that was something that was happening and a lot of times we needed some form of power distribution. And that came about when they brought what we call the dis- decentralization aspect of development where we're able to shift the power down to the community where we have assembly members in the community who are the voice of the government, but not a government going there straight to let them do this or do that. But you can have a member of, of your community who is assemblyman who actually has a sole mandate to be able to make choices together with the community. The same way we had a traditional leaders who were also very active in development those times who could actually carry the mandate of power or the mandate of pulling the community together to be able to help. So corruption has also been one of the biggest banes in terms of development for countries. So these are some of the few perspectives that has made development a bit checkered in, 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 in our country. Thank you, Dr. Cornelius, for the in-depth explanation. That was really helpful. We talked about so unequal distribution of wealth, corruption, political instability, and how these have played a role in the past. You mentioned the wealth gap. Are there other areas how those um, factors have played a role into today? Yes. So as I said, I mean, there's still quite a lot of, uh, and as I would say, I mean, when I was talking about development, I mentioned that at the beginning, uh, the first president tried bringing in a lot of industrialization. I think one major thing he did was also to, to, to put a gradient at specific places. When you look at community development, there's a perspective that if you're able to put development in one particular area, there is is that desire or there is that will that is going to, you know, translate to the other communities that are around that town. It's just like saying that if I'm able to put maybe a big industrial company in a Kumfi, maybe a Kumfi, a Jankwa, there's a likelihood that the other communities around might be able to benefit because whatever proceeds I got from this industry will be able to affect them. So that's something that happened earlier on. But a lot of these things were done in the city, in the capital, which is Accra. So a lot of development was in Accra, but a lot of that didn't translate to the other communities or the other parts of the country. So we still have some communities that are really, really still very poor. And the only way they can be able to get out of that is to migrate. So there's a lot of migration, even to the city, basically to Accra, just because a lot of industrialization is, is, is based in Accra. And a lot of staff, the good staff, everybody thinks is in Accra. That's why even at this point in time, the COVID, the COVID infections that we are having, we're having about 5,000 cases and about, you know, three feet, about 60% are in Accra. That's how much, you know, people are so condensed in just a small area because of the idea that the good staff is in Accra. So everybody wants to move to Accra. And that is that is one part of, you know, development that has also, I mean, hampered in terms of increasing, getting people out of poverty because a lot of people want to move out of this rural communities to get to the city. And they get to the city and probably they, they, they find the realities that there's no job there. There's no good life there. So now they have to make do with maybe being on the street to sell maybe recharge cards or probably sell some dogs or sell some dog chains in the city 
which might give them a live-in, but they're, they're, they cannot go back because the reason is that, I mean, having something now is better than having nothing in a rural area. And in Accra, you probably have the opportunity or that there's, there's this notion that there might be some luck one day where I might hit big and probably get that chance to also live a luxurious life. So everybody just want to, wants to have a better life, but we just need to make sure we are doing the best well. So definitely migration has been affected. A lot of people are migrating to the cities because they want a good life and because things are not happening back where they're coming from. And as I said, the, the, the world gap is there. And that is also leaving communities poorer because the, the, the human resource that should develop that community are all moving out to the city. So you go out and you find, you find really young men between maybe 17 years to about 35 who are probably supposed to stay back with their parents and develop farmlands and probably get some produce back in the city and probably maybe selling ice cream on the street. So a lot of poverty is going on because these people are also moving out of this community. So we have a lot of communities that are still under the poverty line and trying so hard to get out of that, that aspect. Yeah. Healthcare has also been affected basically because as, as I said, as the good things are in Accra, everybody wants to put a lot of facilities in Accra. So you have all the private facilities, the health insurance companies all being in Accra and not moving out to the communities. So the community has to probably uh, rely on social interventions from the government to be able to even get healthcare and all the education same wise. A lot of stuff is going on in the city and not in the communities. Basically, uh, an example is uh, if you finish your junior high school, you're supposed to write the, the certificate exam, which is written by every student in Ghana within that year group. And they write an ICT exam that is much more of uh, computer literacy. But nobody in a Kumfi has access to a computer. But the kid who school there is supposed to write the ICT exam, just the same as the kid who lives in Cantonment, which is more like the Buzoa area in, in, in the city. And they have laptops and have iPads and have phones. And they are supposed to write that same exam. You get it. So that is the, the difference in how things are distributed right now, which is affecting poverty a lot in, in our country. And the next question we wanted to ask, what are the largest areas of development in Ghana that have advanced in the last five years? Thank you for that. Um, I think uh, within the last five years, the economic development or the economic uh, gains of the country has been quite developed uh, over the last five years. Uh, reason being that uh, uh, a lot of the previous government realized that the economic, the economic, I mean, capacity of the country was was in trouble. So we had to put in measures to really um, develop the economic uh, or the macroeconomic uh, indicators for the country. So they worked basically on that. And this current government has done a lot of work in that regard. Uh, actually, just beginning of this year, Bloomberg was actually tooting Ghana as in Africa as the the the, the, the the best in terms of development indices, we're looking like the best in Africa in terms of how we're going to develop our markets. I mean, just unfortunately, this COVID thing has actually derailed that uh, that prediction. But we were on a good path in terms of economic health, economic development. We were on a good path. Uh, the same way, I also speak for health. I think uh, the past government also put in a lot of health infrastructure. Uh, though I think the distribution was still a problem, but I think they built a number of hospitals that, that were not there before. I mean, I would question whether they had put a lot of effort into the workforce or the human resource. But I think in terms of the structural, infrastructural development, they were able to do that. We also had a significant issue in our power distribution over the last number of years. We had issues with uh, having erratic power supplies, which affected businesses a lot and affected uh, schooling and a lot of industries. As it was a big issue for the past government, and that is why they basically lost the elections because they had to. Ghana had a whole loading, I mean, a load shedding program where we had to decide when this part of the country will be on and off or this part of the city. So maybe you have light from 6 p.m. till 6 a.m. and then you're off and another part comes on. So it was quite a huge issue, but at least they were able to put in some efforts before they left power. And now this current government has been able to maintain adequately our power basically in the city, which has been of tremendous help to the industries to be able to produce and also for the small scale businesses to be able to actually function. So I think in terms of power, in terms of hospital infrastructure, and also in terms of those are, those are parts that I think there's been some significant uh, uh, you know, gains within the last five years. Yeah. 
Thank you for that. It's interesting to hear the different areas that have come to fruition over the years with development throughout the country. What are the largest areas do you think that you would like to see improved in the next five years? Great, 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 great. So there, there's a lot I want to see improved in the next five years. But I mean, I wouldn't say we are we are doing so bad because Ghana looks more like a beacon for for the other uh, African countries. But I always say that I, I don't believe in mediocrity. I think if if we have this much resources, if God has given us this much resources, I think it's, there are so many ways we can make the lives of our people better. And uh, one critical part that I want us to improve is a lot, a lot much in terms of healthcare. I mean, probably I might be a bit more biased because I'm in the healthcare system. So that's the first one I'll talk about. Uh, I think there's a lot that needs to be done. And COVID, which is a pandemic, has come to tell us that healthcare is something that is essential, something that is a basic human right that everybody should be able to enjoy. And I think what I want improved basically is uh, a lot of investment in infrastructure in terms of healthcare because people were even predicting that people were going to just die on the streets in Africa because of COVID-19. That is not happening. I mean, I think there's there's a bit of luck. There's a bit of, of some saving grace, I'll say, because we are just doing this 24 deaths at this point in time over the past maybe two, three months and just about 5,000, a little bit about 5,000 cases. Uh, I don't know what is saving us. Maybe it could be weather. It could be some immunization regime that has been done. I don't know, but I just think we're lucky. But maybe the next time we might not be that lucky. We might not have good, uh, I mean, numbers like we're doing now. Uh, whilst we see other countries, actually, countries that we believe were so strong in terms of their healthcare system, actually just dying under this this really, you know, atrocious pandemic. So I would want a lot more of investment in infrastructure where we can have probably every district or every community have at least a health post and, you know, have professionals that can man this health post and be able to work actually from bottom up. Because right now, a lot of the health infrastructure is just from the top down. Policies are made in all the big hotels in Accra, like Marvin Pig, like Pam. The ministers and their yeah, cohorts just sit down, just a lot more of just elitism, just sit down and make policies and expect the ordinary man who is in a comfy Nakwa to just, you know, oblige or just move along with it, not knowing what is really going on there, not really sending people there to find out what the people want there. So I think there's a lot needs to be changed about health policy in terms of how it is made and how it's implemented and how it's monitored, basically. And a lot more investment in the infrastructure and then a lot more investment in the workforce where we need more doctors trained and because the doctor patient ratio is, is crazy. We need a lot more people to, to, to get into the workforce to be able to reduce the kind of stress that the, the, the doctors or nurses or other allied healthcare professionals are actually facing right now. The other aspect I want to improve is also the economic empowerment aspect of our you know development. I think there are a lot of I mean, one major um, resource we have is a human resource, and and one characteristics of of the re, of the resources the women. The women are, are, are amazing here. They are hardworking. They are. I think I just don't know. You can find a woman who goes to the farm, carries two babies, one at the back, one in front, has a whole loads on her head, and still is going to weed to the farm just like the husband is doing, and get back home and cook for the kids to eat bathe them and the husband just sits down and watch and do all that. So we have women with strength. We have women with so tremendous capability. All they need is just that push. All they need is just that capital to be able to evolve, you know, uh, develop in the community. So I think it's something that we need the government to push a lot more. We have, we have a ministry for uh, what we call gender and women empowerment, but I think they're not doing that much. I think we can be able to actively and in terms of purposefully and proactively, you know, invest in women. And I think anytime we have women being empowered, there's always development coming along with that. And funny enough, as a Ghanaian who made the statement that if you educate a woman, if you educate a man, you educate just one person. But if you educate a woman, you educate a whole generation. The, the reason being that she'll be able to get back women, teach her kids, and let the other kids around know about what she's learned. But the man just get what she's learned, and the next probably target is just to get work and get some money. It's not about the family. It's not about 
imparting that knowledge. So, and it's a Ghanaian who made that profound statement. So I think we need to also proactively look forward in engaging women in econo- economic empowerment. And that would help us a lot in the next few years if you want to develop you know, Ghana holistically. Yeah. And I think the final part I'll talk about is education. Definitely we need to, in a country that wants to develop, must be able to put in a lot of investment in education. I think we are doing our best now, but we can do better. This, this, this government just started with a free senior high school program, which was one of their political uh, I mean, ideas that they brought in. I just think that we can be able to make it better and make it a bit more nationwide and let everybody benefit from that, where every child can go to school from basic education till the high school. You know, and then all they have to do is just do college and be able to to, 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 to find something to do for themselves. So I think we, we are doing a lot, but I think we can do better in this regards. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. I love your answers on this one. Uh, it really puts everything into perspective. Obviously, there are a lot of sectors that play a role in the development uh, throughout the country. But what do you think of Global Brigade's role? Okay, great, great. I, I think uh, community development has been something that, as I said, started so many years ago, but a lot of, a lot of focus or a lot of development or a lot of you know, improvement has happened because of the role of the non-government sector, which GB is actually a part of. A lot of situations have been brought forward or brought forth because of the work of some NGOs that have been in our communities for so long. We've had UNICEF, we've had Oxfam, we have the big organizations coming and they've been able to to highlight some deficiencies in whatever is happening. As I said, the government is much of a central government just in the city trying to make things happen in the rural areas, but they are not on the ground. So a lot of times these NGOs are on the ground. They are able to, to you know, highlight what the deficiencies and whatever programs they are bringing to these communities, you know, to work. That is, and one main unique characteristic of GB that I love is because of how it is community, community based. It is base is down there to the least person it doesn't work in the in the city where there's so much but it goes down to the people who need so much empowerment and that is why i i, I wanted to join or i i have joined this organization so gb is, is is placed very 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 strategically the reason being that we might not be so well known in ghana now but very soon i think with a model with the way we operate anybody who hears about gb knows that these people are doing something so different because the Oxfam's, the UNICEF, they all come, but they all work in silos. All of them are able to implement a project and then they go. But GV is able to implement the holistic aspect of projects where we are able to not only focus on one aspect, but focus on every important part of that cycle to reduce poverty in, in the community. So it's, it's very strategically placed. And I think with so much work that we are doing, it's just a matter of time that the government and the, and the other big organizations hear about us and then we can be able to scale up. Because what I, I think we need to do as GB is just to let them know our, you know our footprint, let them know our blueprint, how we operate. And anybody who hears about blueprint is so happy that there is an organization that's able to, you know, focus on all aspects of somebody or community to get them out of poverty. So it's our work is, is there. It, it will highlight most of the deficiencies which is which we do an example is the medical program we are able to share data with the health directorate we are able to tell them what is going on for them to be able to put in measures for them to be able to put in ideas we just commissioned a maternity unit for a kumpano and handed it over to the health directorate and now they are so happy because a skilled delivery at birth is going to increase in the community and that is one of the most important indicators to show that there's a good healthcare system if a, if a pregnant woman is able to get a skilled you know professional to be able to attend to bed it, it shows that definitely that there, there's an improvement in the healthcare system so that is something that we are doing there's so much we are doing on the ground highlighting the deficiencies that are going on and also the model that we are also creating with is so you know significant and it's so you know unique that i think anybody who is going to hear hear about us in terms of the big organizations and the government very soon we are going to blow you're going to probably go from community to community just implementing this holistic model of, of operations here. Yeah. 
Thank you for that, Dr. C. And one thing I want to add on to that, I was glad that you touched on the effort that we really take to do like community development and to focus on what the community needs. Just for the volunteers to know, Ghana, Ghana is our fastest growing country in the right often. I think in the last few years, Ghana's GDP has had like a 10% growth, which is amazing. Most like the US, for example, only typically has a two, maybe 3% growth in really large years. So to have this blossoming growth, there's also been a lot of NGO investment. And I, I hope that other NGOs like attach onto this model of listening to the community, listening to what people need, and then attacking it from that really grassroots level. Great. And probably just to add to that, empowerment is is really about giving the choice to the people. At the end of the day, they decide what they want to do. It's the same way when we were trying to create this clinic to them, we went to the community, had focus group discussions with them, and they all mentioned that the most important thing we need now is a place we can deliver, we can give back. Because now we have to live at home. And if we have complications, we have to travel about two, three hours to be able to get a pregnant woman delivered. And, and then any delay along the way can lead to what maternal, maternal mortality, which is a big issue in a healthcare system. We don't want a woman dying whilst trying to you know, give birth to a new baby. So having them, talking to them and telling us that this is what they want. They want you to give them this clinic. We will take care of it. We need a maternity unit. And that's what we give them. And I think that's that's quite stellar and quite unique about how GB operations are, you know, going on in, in, in Ghana. Definitely. And that's something that I've always thought was really special about the team in Ghana is that you all are really devoted to making the community members goals a priority and working to empower them through that. Um, Those are all the questions I have today. We wanted to really thank you, Dr. C, so much for joining us here and putting your time and energy into this. It has been really interesting to hear it from your perspective and kind of put everything in order. I think we could talk about this for hours and like really dive into each subject, but we'll leave that to us to do some independent research. And thank you to our listeners for joining today. If you do want to continue this conversation, you can reach out to your program associate or the administration email through the Global Brigade's website. And we are here to continue talking about it. But that's all we have for you today. We wish you luck with the rest of your brigade planning process.